In this video, we're going to talk about Matterport, trading under the ticker symbol MTTR. At the moment, there's a lot of volatilities coming out of the financial market, in particular with the growth stocks. And this is why we got to be careful about which stocks to buy, which stocks to sell. This video is going to cover the recent price action's momentum and the technicals of the stock. Before the video begins, a quick heads up that my analysis is based on sessions already completed and that it may not take into consideration the latest events. If that is the case, I will make follow-up videos to reflect them. With that being said, let's begin with today's topic. During the most recent trading session, the stock increased to $7.16 before closing the trading day at $6.83. We should pay attention to the $8 level nearby because it was tested five times before and it was a very significant support level, which has been pierced through. Over the past 30 days, the trend of the stock has been bearish because the stock has been having lower peaks from $11 to $10 to $9.40. From the perspective of a longer time frame though, six months and above, the trend of the stock has been bullish for a very long period of time until the recent sell-off, which is significant enough to, I would say, move the trend from bullish to ranging. But the reality is that we simply don't have enough backlog data for the moment to necessarily conclude on this matter. For the moment, the stock is located at a very low level ever since the stock began trading, and that can be a potential opportunity for those with a very high risk tolerance. When we look at the price trend overall, it has been accelerating as the downward slope has been quite steep, and there was recently a gap lower as well. It's safe to say that there has been a lot of downward pressure and we have to see over the next week or so to determine whether there is a solid support level existing or forming somewhere. The trading volume of Matterport has recently been 16 million shares compared to an average volume of 17 million shares. Over the previous 52 week period, its price fluctuated between $6.20 and $37.60. The market cap of Matterport is currently at $1.7 billion versus an enterprise value of $4.6 billion. The difference between the market cap and the enterprise value is the premium or discount the financial market is willing to allocate to the company based on its current fundamentals, leverage, and asset composition. The enterprise value is the combined value of the company's assets minus the debts. If the company has a lot of debts or has a negative image amongst market participants, the asset's value may be impaired. With that being said, at the end of the day, it remains an estimation of the market every time it publishes its financial statements. So it's less reactive than the market cap and often more lenient for many other companies. One key element to note regarding the enterprise value is that for many growth type companies, one of the most significant assets they own is the goodwill. Goodwill is basically an expectation of the market that the company is able to generate more profits or to grow faster than its rivals because it has a good management team, stronger brand recognition, and bigger online following. It is basically what makes a company unique when compared to an alternative company. In other words, it's not a tangible asset that companies may use, but it's often the reason why some companies, from a purely accounting perspective, is trading at a discount because the market cap is lower than the enterprise value since the enterprise value is less reactive to the market cap. If the company goes to liquidation, the goodwill is completely gone and the shareholders and bondholders would be left distributing what is left on the balance sheet, which is going to be a lot less than what we think there is. When we compare the current price to its historical price fluctuations, the stock is 10% higher than the one-month low, 10% higher than the three-month low, and 10% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which often gives a hint on the market sentiment about where the stock price is likely going to head toward, the implied volatility is 126% versus a historical volatility of 105%. The put call volume ratio is currently at 1.41. It is normal for most stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they truly deserve because 
many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 36,000 contracts in a day versus the 30-day average of 24,000. Regarding the open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 360,000 contracts versus the 30-day average of 288,000 contracts. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 6% of its outstanding shares, which is very low. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, BlackRock, and Morgan Stanley. It is relevant to understand the shareholder composition and percentage of a company because it helps to determine whether you should hold the stock long term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by the retail traders, then this can be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long-term trust from shareholders. Typically, the consensus is that there should be at least 25-30% to 30 of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade. This is obviously subjected to a lot of exceptions since many great companies are mostly held by retail as well, but that's the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. The current short interest is 15% of the total float, which is significant but not worrisome to the point that I would say that there's a short operation going on and 56% of it come from the dark pool transactions. Overall, my opinion on Matterport is to keep it on your watch list, but don't go in at the moment, just yet. The maximum exposure I would recommend would be 1% of your portfolio when you decide to buy it, but for the immediate term, my recommendation is to wait for the better timing, because we have to see some confirmations about a support level being formed before going further. I would recommend to separate the allocation to batches of 2% at a time so that you can have enough room to purchase later. In this current market environment, I believe that we should be careful about taking positions and risk in the financial market in general and in the equity market in particular. Because over the past decade or so, the financial market has been living with the help of newly created capital from QEs resulting in a massive increase of asset prices and the corresponding decrease in their yields. And the low interest rate also contributed to reinforce this phenomenon because the financial sector would see its profit margins reduced and in turn keeps the returns of other sectors and employees low as well. At the same time, the market doesn't represent the real economy and the real economy doesn't get reflected in the price of different securities. The market is a game of supply and demand, which will depend on a number of factors, not just the fundamentals. If the asset prices only depend on the fundamentals, then their performances in the Northern Hemisphere would have been more than mediocre, because things have been mostly stagnant over the years. A few things can explain why asset prices managed to remain high despite the stagnation of the underlying businesses. The first one is that over the years, there has been more money printed by different central banks to support their own economies. But because that money is distributed to banks and expected to loan to businesses to create more jobs, and that in fact there aren't that many opportunities out there, this money became capital that travels around the world and went into the huge financial melting pot. The QEs are now wrapping up in many countries, so I don't think that it'll remain as the main driving force over the next couple of years to keep the asset prices up. But it's compensated by the arrival of new capital from different regions to North America because it's perceived as a safe haven for investors. With the rising tensions around the world, this capital inflow will probably be sustained over the next couple of years, if not intensifying. The last phenomenon is the creation of artificial bubbles that are either supported by real market trends or completely fictional ones to allow market participants to play the game of hot potato 
and to either create profits or to safe keep their capital. The EV sector back in 2020 is an excellent example of this. But nevertheless, what it means for the market is that the degree of uncertainty is probably going to increase over the foreseeable future as the expectation for a recession has been building up for more than a decade and that the economic difficulties are accumulating around the world, especially from Asia. What this means for the market and for us is that the volatility is supposed to increase over time, which will provide opportunities to make a profit or to incur losses, depending on the timing and risk management. Another thing to note for this period of time is that we have to be very careful about having shorts. It's already riskier than having longs because the losses of shorts are not limited, right? Because there's no limit in terms of how far the stock can increase. But with the increased involvement of short sellers, I believe that the stocks been shorted will have an even higher probability of getting squeezed, which will result in potentially massive losses. So we're also like observing more of an irrational behavior from market participants in the sense that very often people will choose to rush in a position, not necessarily because the fundamentals are convincing, but because there's a buildup of demand in a specific stock and people will pile in to ride the gravy train with the rest of us. That kind of behavior is highly risky and may result in losses. It's worth pointing out that in 2020 and probably in 2021, the market has never presented that many opportunities. But it was also during that same period of time that many retail traders have incurred their biggest losses. A rule of thumb is that each position should be structured so that even if they don't succeed, they don't impact the portfolio stability. Positions should begin small so that there is an opportunity to average down later. And specifically for the growth stocks, I think that 5 to 10% overall should be a healthy weight for the portfolio. And each stock should represent about 1 to like 3% of the positions. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.